Scott Galloway, hey, good to see you. Glad to have you here. Thanks, Sam. It's always good to be with you. Lots to talk about, uh, but I want to start with an issue that has been increasingly both exciting me and worrying me, which is the explosive growth of artificial intelligence. Where are you on the panic versus elation scale? I'm more sort of uh, somewhere around a, a six or a seven, and that is I'm cautiously optimistic. If you look at any major breakthrough in technology, we kind of go through the same cycle. And that is we immediately go to job losses or we go to a concern around job losses. And we're seeing that here. The majority of the articles are around how many thousands or millions of jobs are going to be lost in the services sector or in um, kind of the information like this could do to manufacturing uh, or this could do to the information economy, what robotics did to manufacturing is kind of the general consensus of the media. And what you see throughout history is every major technological innovation usually has a certain amount of pain and dislocation, but over time creates a lot more jobs than it destroys. I mean, three out of five people in America used to get their living from agriculture, and we essentially destroyed all of those jobs with technology, but we created a ton of new ones. So I believe we're going through the cycle where it's more, we're more fearful than hopeful, but I actually think it's going to create a lot more jobs. And I think it's exciting. I think it's going to have huge impact specifically around healthcare. So let's explain to the audience for a moment, ChatGPT, OpenAI, what is it? Why is it such an extraordinary transformative technology? So it's sort of a language prediction engine that looks at language and analyzes it to the extent that it can predict the next word, if you will. Uh, it doesn't think or come up with answers. It comes up with words. So if you say, what is the color of the night sky? It looks at its data set and figures out that the best answer is it'll say black. And it can also even start to figure out tone in the sense that it figures out what words, the relationship between them, and recognizes words that are, are posed to it in queries. So it's sort of a prediction engine. And ChatGPT uh, is kind of the first public product from OpenAI, a group that was formed at least initially as um, an, an organization that would attempt to be mindful of the problems that AI would produce. But AI has been around a long time. AI is in uh, customer call centers. It's in Netflix. It's in the tech stack and meta. But this seems to have encapsulated a lot of the promise and energy and has created sort of, if you will, an, an arms race all of a sudden. Which are the companies that you think or the sectors that you think are so far most effectively able to grab onto uh, these, these new opportunities? Well, it could take search to the new level. If you think about Google, search really hasn't innovated in about 20 years. The only thing that's changed about search is that there's more and more ads that are less and less obvious or less and less transparent to their ads. Remember when you initially did a Google search 20 years ago and there were two blue shaded uh, first returns that said ad. Now they've taken those shades away and sometimes 60, 70 percent of the first page are not necessarily a place that takes you to the best answer, but it takes you to a place that Google can further monetize. And their incentives have made them very disruptible because what chat GPT and sort of AI driven or language structure driven search does, it says, OK, rather than offering you dozens and dozens of answers that might be somewhere between 30 and 70 percent accurate, we think we can give you one that's sort of 60 to 80 percent accurate. Uh, and the reason, I mean, Google, it's a classic innovator's dilemma. And Google had this technology. Google developed a lot of it, but doesn't want to undermine or disrupt an unbelievable $150 billion toll booth business model and give people the best answer. They want to give them a lot of answers. So I think the first kind of industry to be disrupted, if you will, will be uh, search. Um, now, whether or not it holds the same promise, I think it holds huge promise around unstructured data sets to feed in all of your health records and then start making interesting predictions or things you should be at least cognizant of in your own health. But it would strike me that it has huge applications around um, uh, technology and disrupting traditional players. And then we're probably going to see all sorts of applications in healthcare. I also wonder what it means for our defense department in terms of scenario planning, but that's more your ballywick. There are a lot of people that are going to have relationships with these bots. There are a lot of people that are going to have a hard time differentiating between what is a human being and what is the latest version of GPT. And I, I wonder what that makes you think. 
you see the potential pretty quickly if you use ChatGPT or Dolly for very long. And there's a lot of upside, but you can also imagine asking ChatGPT to come up with 20 myths or conspiracy theories around vaccines in the voice of a, a credible doctor. And then testing those conspiracy theories on social to see which gets the most traction, picking the two or three that spread the fastest, pouring some fuel behind them, weaponizing a bunch of bots. I mean, this does feel like it's an engine room for misinformation. And the notion, and it gets a lot of stuff wrong. Um, it, so you can see it could go uh, very, you know, very bad places very fast. I think there's going to be a lot of different chatbots, and I wonder how differentiated they're going to be. The people who might end up having the rare earth material here are the people who have control and produce uh, really robust data sets. I mean, as much as I, I'm not a fan of Elon Musk and Twitter, you wonder if Twitter. If someone were to say to me that Elon Musk were, got his $45 billion back, that somehow we recovered that $45 billion equity investment, which has been vaporized as of now, I would guess that, that a chat, that an artificial intelligence engine found a way to take the unstructured data set that we produce every day in terms of mood, emotion, what we're talking about, what news is trending, and that he licensed it and got huge dollars for that data set that we produce every day on Twitter. So whether it's health information, weather information, sports information, you know, there are going to be a ton of companies that pop up that do nothing but collect structure and feed uh, data sets into these uh, beasts that will have insatiable appetites. I mean, it's kind of the difference between light crude and, and Texas West Intermediate. It's I think that's going to be the real, the real value here will be the people who uh, control the most interesting and robust data sets. Yeah, I mean, and give, given the real-time connectivity that so many people around the planet have on social media, I mean, you could imagine that the fastest way to find out about an emerging new pandemic or even, you know, sort of your latest flu wave would be much more effective through a data set like that, which so far has been relatively unmined uh, in, in, in term for that, for that scientific purpose, at least, and monetizable. Yeah, it just reminded me, and it's a, it's a weird analogy, but Secretary Buttigieg is talking about, they asked him what infrastructure investment he was most excited about, and he said smart sewers. I would argue, other than books, it's the most important technology ever. To put sensors, sensors in sewers, and they can tell when, it, when COVID is, is spiking in an area. I, you know, could Twitter be a smart sewer? <laughs> and that is, could it wade through all, all of the material and waste and find out interesting things around what's trending, where people are starting to get angry, where people are starting to become, you know, could you at when, when there's violence across nations, will you be able to get to a point where you can uh, predict that with greater accuracy based on the way people are behaving and the sentiment and the language they're using on Twitter? OK, so I have to go to on a slight angle here as a political scientist. In your view, does that make it imperative that TikTok is banned in the United States? Uh, I think of just TikTok as the ultimate propaganda tool. I don't. I think Facebook and Meta are the ultimate espionage tool, and I think they've actually, I would bet, my thesis is the reason there's been no, absolutely no um, regulation of Facebook is I would bet, uh, and I'm curious if you believe this as well, that our security apparatus works pretty closely with Meta, and there's sort of a behind, behind the closed doors deal that we will continue to help you hunt down bad guys. I mean, Meta is the ultimate espionage tool. It not only knows where you are, what you're doing, but who your relationships are and how you interact with them. That is that the GRU, the Mossad, the NSA couldn't have thought of that in their wildest dreams. I think TikTok is the ultimate propaganda tool. So young people would now rather have TikTok than almost all other major media. They're on it. I think the CCP would be dumb not to put their thumbs on the scale of content slowly but surely that sheds uh, the West in a poor light. And my fear is slowly but surely without even knowing it. The best sting is the con or the mark never knows they were conned. And I worry we don't even know we're being conned right now because I think slowly but surely we're raising a generation of civic, business, nonprofit, and military leaders that every day just feel a little bit worse about America. And I think you see it in our surveys. People think the economy is really bad when it's not. People don't want to acknowledge the progress we've made around everything from systemic racism to eliminating d infectious diseases. There just doesn't seem to be any appetite so, to acknowledge any of it. And I wonder if it's slowly but surely going to get worse at the well, hands of TikTok. I, I agree with the problem. 
for decades, you know, the biggest issue in terms of digital inequality was about the digital divide. Who are the people that are online and offline? And there are a lot of people that just don't have access to information. Increasingly, what you and I are talking about today is it's less about the digital divide. It's the people that are online that believe things that aren't true. They're being fed disinformation and just how much this can be accelerated and weaponized in this environment of generative AI by these social media platforms strikes me as an unsustainable trajectory. People ask me, what's the biggest threat to America? And I say, I, I would argue that geopolitically, and I may even be just parroting your words here, that we've, it's hard to imagine a time when we were stronger, we're food independent, relatively speaking, we're food independent, we're energy independent, no one's lining up for Chinese or Russian vaccines, smartest, brightest people in the world all still wanna come here um, we have an economy right now that is growing again. Our inflation is bad, but it's less bad than anywhere else in the world. It's like, if you want to talk about what's bad about America, I think you have to show up with, well, where, where would you rather be? In China, where the equivalent of the Dow has been cut in half, in Europe, which is, has low growth. And I mean, where, where, who exactly is doing half as well as we are, or who's doing less bad than we are right now? And but the problem is the horror movie, if America's a horror movie, the call is coming from inside of the house. I was very discouraged watching the State of the Union, just how angry we are at each other. These are people who are elected representatives, all Americans, many of them similar backgrounds, all doing the same job. They work together. They live close to each other. They go to cocktail parties with each other and they scream at each other in the middle of a in the middle of a meeting. It just. It just shocks me the lack of camaraderie, the lack of patriotism, the lack of connective tissue. You know, we're we're rotting from the inside out uh, externally. I don't think we've ever I would argue we've never been this strong, but we're tearing each other apart from the inside. And I do think social media and media's uh, cycle time that leads to catastrophizing everything gives us the sense that things are much worse than they are. And it's it's not another nation's fault. It's your neighbor's fault. So what do you think um, the uh, beginnings of any solution might be? Because the social media companies are clearly not self-regulating in a direction uh, that would lead to resolving this problem. Well, I'm a fan of antitrust. I think if you had more competition that eventually a social media company would raise their hand and say, we're going to age gate at 16. There's no reason to have kids on social media that we're going to um, be much more, much more um, stringent about misinformation. And we're going to stop pretending and using the First Amendment as some sort of blanket coverage to not do anything. And we're going to uh, fact check things just as traditional media companies do. Uh, but also, I don't think this gets a lot better until someone, a, a key executive at a big tech company is criminally charged and walked off. Um, I just don't think they, we can't come up with fines that are big enough. So the algebra of deterrence here is just not in place. And then on a broader level from a national scale, I think we need na mandatory national service. I think we need to get young people in the same uniform again so they see each other as Americans, not as people of different sexual orientations or different uh, political parties. I think we need more third places so people can get together, young people can get together and establish mentorships, establish romantic relationships, learn, you know, uh, uh, the fundamental element of any society is relationships. And we aren't building enough of them because people are in their homes or on their devices. So a massive investment in young people that makes them more optimistic about the future, shared collective experiences in the service of our nation, and holding our media complex, specifically social media, more accountable for the damage they're doing. So is, is it fair to say, I mean, that both um, the positive developments that we're seeing in the United States in terms of its geopolitical, its economic strength um, are being driven, will be driven very strongly by uh, new changes in AI, but also all of the negative things that you just suggested that are deep problems inside the United States, especially when we talk about relationships between people, that's also one of the biggest challenges that will be exacerbated by the rollout of these new AI tools. Anytime you take one source or material or a piece of information and you convert it into something that is more valuable, whether it's petroleum, whether it's oil into petroleum, whether it's attention into ads, there's emissions and externalities. And we decided to regulate the emissions around carbon emissions. I mean, we might've been a little bit late, it might not go as far as we should, 
but we have we have emission standards. We have an act to try and reduce carbon. Um, when we have translated attention to Nissan ads, it's created um, a very negative externality, and that is key people's attention. I mean, think about the cadence of news. If we could only have one headline news story the last century, it probably, I would bet, would be the West turns back tyranny. If we had to pick one headline for the last 100 years, if we had to pick one headline for the last 50 years, I would argue it would be unprecedented historic prosperity led by China and the U.S. You'd have to, I would think you would have to have positive headlines, but because we have a headline every, every three seconds to try and maintain our attention, we go to catastrophizing because that's what keeps our attention. But we, aren't, we don't seem to have, want to have the same type of regulation or standards to control or recognize these emissions. I'm an ageist. I think, I don't know about you, I have a diffi more difficult time wrapping my head around technology uh, as I get older. And every year, we continue to have the oldest elected representative body of almost any democracy. The average age of our elected representatives is 62. So for, I mean, how many 62-year-olds... So that means for every 40 year old we have, we have an 84 year old. At one point, I think a third of all elected representatives had someone on their staff print out their emails. So are, are these the people to really be figuring out the legislation and the regulation for technology? We're, we're really, we have a real dearth of domain expertise around the people who need to figure out the laws here. Scott Galloway, great to have you here. Yeah, it's great to be with you, Ian.